What's up, YouTubers? Here with Budo Dave on the way to EBI 5. EBI 5 takes place tonight at the Orpheum Theater. It's going to be a great event. And a lot of you guys might not know Budo Dave. He's usually the man behind the camera. He's been a friend since high school. Business partners with Budo Videos. We started the company like 2002. 2003, maybe. Yeah. And uh, he actually started jiu-jitsu before I did, so I'm going to ask him a few questions. Don't first, ask me about jiu-jitsu, though. <laughs> <laughs> but first of all, uh, how do you feel going to EBI today? Man, I'm really, really excited to go to EBI. I think EBI is, uh, I don't want to get too sidetracked, but I really think it's like the best and most exciting jiu-jitsu event going right now. Just because Eddie created like this really, really unique rule set makes for an exciting show you know it's very compact it's, it's like I think he kind of makes a comparison it's like the UFC of Jiu Jitsu events and I think there's I think there's some truth to that you know like it, it, it's it's a show as opposed to um, like a Jiu Jitsu tournament so to speak right? but I like I love it when EBI comes around it's it's the atmosphere is great the, 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 the venue is so fun it's a really cool part of town and, um, you know, great Eddie and working with his crew are always really great to work with. Um, man, it's just fun, right? I mean, it, it, it's, it's a really long day. You know, we probably won't get out of there until probably maybe midnight. Um, but, no, I'm excited. I love, I love I love EBI nights. Yeah, as a spectator, it's cool to be able to just focus on one match at a time. And like you alluded to, the rule set where you see a submission in almost every match makes it pretty exciting. Yeah. Who are you going to say, uh, <clears throat> make a prediction, who's going to be in the finals and who's going to win it? Um, you know, it's really hard to say. There's a few guys that I, that I, that I don't know. Um, I think I'm excited to see uh, Ronnie fight because it's been a really long time since we've seen him. Um, I know he was in MMA for a while. He had really good jiu-jitsu in MMA, but I just haven't seen a whole lot of him. You know, I think, I think he's, a, he's a very interesting name, but his lack of competition in the last few years is kind of unknown. I don't know, maybe, maybe I just haven't been paying attention, but um, I think it's a really interesting mix, you know, to throw into the mix. Um, of course, Gary Tonin coming down in weight, you know, as long as the weight cut doesn't hurt him too much. Uh, I saw him eating pancakes this morning. Oh, so then, he, right. then, so then he's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, but I mean, the whole, you know, it's, it's sometimes not always, it's not always like the best guys who put on the best fights, you know, that's, um, that's actually what I'm looking for. It's just, I just want to see really good jiu-jitsu. So, handle the production of all these events you know a lot of people know me just because I'm kind of more the face of the company but on all these live events that we do whether they're IBGF events or ADCC or EBI you're the one managing the whole crew of, uh, that we have and um, how, how is that is it is it difficult in this day and age to do live events um, you know certainly there's you know technology improves improves all the time and things become easier but it's never as easy, I think, as most people think it is. Um, there's always a challenge with every event that we do because all the circumstances are always really different. Whether we're doing, you know, a multi-map broadcast for the IBJJF, or we're doing, um, you know, event in Sao Paulo or in the UK or you know wherever it may be, every single one of those events brings its own set of challenges that are that are <laughs> I don't know, that's like incredible challenges, you know. I mean, um, I'm sorry, but the question was, is it easy? No, no, it's ne it's it's never easy. I, I think with EBI, I think, um, I wouldn't say EBI is easy, but the fact that we've been in the same venue, you know, working with the same crew, like, you know, we've got a system down definitely for that, but even still, like, with this event, even though we've done it before, our setup time was two days prior, and, you know, I, I sometimes I get a little nervous, like, what's gonna, what am I going to find when we get to the arena, you know, and anything can happen, it's, it's, um, there's a lot of variables and a lot of things, a lot of moving parts. So, um, and trying to put on a really good show that's live, and you have to get everything perfect, you know. Right, 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 right when we say go, that's that's, that's 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 a challenge. Yeah, I see all the stuff that you and the rest of the crew goes through, and there's, like you say, it's always something different. And yeah. I see these guys online saying, "Hey, I'm gonna have the small tournament. I'm gonna broadcast it on on YouTube with my iPhone." It's like, oh man, it's not that easy. Yeah, and we've seen a few of those. Yeah. Or haven't seen it. Oh, we haven't seen it. That's right. <laughs> oh, we've heard of. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Go ahead. So let's go back to the beginning. Can you remember the first time you ever saw a martial art, whether it was a TV or a movie or anything that really inspired you? Um, I do. It was. Uh, I want to say it was 1984. 
I had a, uh, a classmate in middle school, in elementary school whose father taught Shotokan karate. And um, I was really intimidated to go to the class. And my brother signed up, and I would go, and my brother would take the class. And I was really, I was, I was too little, I think, uh, maybe five or six. And, but I got really turned off on it because I remember it smelled so bad because <laughs> everybody was like sweating. Um, but yeah, and of course, I think like everybody else, you know, like watching Bruce Lee films, and, you know, just being amazed at what people can do with their body. That, that was my first like, experience or impression or uh, experience with, you know, uh, martial arts. And what was your first martial arts class that you took? Uh, that was with you. We did the, uh, uh, God, what was the name? I don't remember. Ray, Ray Schneider's Academy of Self Defense. It was mixed martial arts before it was mixed martial arts. The combination of like uh, Kempo karate and kung fu, boxing and some jiu jitsu. That was fun. Yeah. It was fun. Ray Schneider's teacher's name was uh, David German, the, the late David German, and he was a badass. Yeah. He knew a lot of stuff back then when not a lot of people knew it. You know, there was grappling, uh, you know, a lot of ground fighting in the system. Right. Not of it, all of it would be. Uh, viewed the same way today, you know, in terms of practicality, but it was still, it was a lot of fun. I remember when we were training, it was pre-UFC, and I think we had just left the school for whatever reason, and it was 1993, and the, <laughs> and the UFC came on, and I remember Keith Nackney came on, and he was like a Kempo guy, and we were basically a Kempo school, I'm like, all right, the Kempo guy is gonna totally gonna win, because Kempo is like the best martial art. <laughs> Well, well Keith Hackett yeah. did use the evil claw. He did, yeah, he yeah. did. That was so funny. Joe Son. And, and he actually did pretty good, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> good, good nut shots yeah. there. And then he also knocked out uh, Emmanuel Yarborough. Right. Well, knocked him down with a jumping punch. That was pretty cool. And I think he, he looked like he broke his head, I think, when yeah. he was punching. Yeah. So then uh, let's move on to Jiu Jitsu. When did you start and why? Um, I started in 2000, I want to say 2000, either late 2002, late 2003. It was actually kind of. You know, within the same year that we started the company, and uh, I had done other martial arts prior to that, right? And uh, kind of felt that I just wanted to do something like different. And it was actually you that said, like, you know, you should probably train a martial art and get a black belt. And I was just like, nah, I just want to train. I want to train something. But I, uh, I signed up at um, uh, what was it, uh, Beverly Hills Jiu Jitsu Club in LA because I was working in LA at the time. And the school is still there. And I remember at the time, like, Boss Rutten was regularly training there, like, Mark Kerr, a lot of MMA guys. And it was at a kind of a time in jiu-jitsu where jiu-jitsu wasn't, like, I mean, it, sports jiu-jitsu certainly existed, but I think, like, jiu-jitsu and MMA was still kind of a little bit of a gray area, you know? Like, people kind of didn't really know the difference. And I remember walking into the class and, like, buying a gi, thinking that I was actually going to do MMA. I mean, it was, I don't even think the term MMA was really used too much back then, you could go, like, Valley Tudor or NHB. Um... And I trained there for about three months until we opened our office in Orange County. But that was my first real experience with jiu-jitsu. That was, that was really eye-opening. That was, yeah, I, I got hurt. Because <laughs> jiu-jitsu was different back then. You know, it wasn't like today where they make jiu-jitsu for everyday people. Like, you, know, you take these classes and a little bit of conditioning, a little bit of training. But then it was like a mix of, of white belts and big guys and small guys. Half the guys in the class were like MMA guys throwing the gi on. And, you know, they just, trained really hard and I was this 170 pound you know kid like 28 years old absolutely no physicality just being tossed around and I remember I'd get out of the car I'm like Jake I did a really great break fall today it was awesome you know? yeah that was uh yeah it was fun it was an interesting experience then you relocated to Orange County and who did you train with there came to Orange County and at the time it was 2004 2005 and not a lot of schools in Orange County um I found the closest one to our office is Clever Luciano. I trained with him for about uh, a good six or seven months. Um, and then again, that was like, you know, at the time, it was a, it was a pretty hard style of, uh, of jiu-jitsu. Uh, people went really hard. But I, I learned a lot, not so much in technique, but I learned, like, how, like, I have to just put a lot of effort, and, and it kind of taught me a certain level of, like, toughness that's required for jiu-jitsu. You, know, you know, because I think prior martials that I did didn't require that kind of, like, step in, and you're basically going to, like, fight for like half an hour um yeah and you know and it was it was it was hard that was hard training uh, but after that and, uh, Marcio and Carlos came and uh, met up with those guys and I kind of found that it was just kind of a little bit of a better fit for me 
I, I just like the teaching style. And kind of been there almost ever since. <laughs> Off and on. So uh, you got your black belt or your brown belt? Brown belt. Uh, last year. Last year. Yeah. How's it feel being a brown belt? <clears throat> um, you know. I think when I was approaching my brown belt, I kind of felt like I was ready. I think because um, I just had I had a lot of experience in jiu-jitsu, in spite of in spite of my rank. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with just the environment that I'm in, just being exposed to a lot and learning a lot. We spend a lot of time with like really high-level guys, <clears throat> whether they come in for an interview or we're doing a DVD with them. You know, we're traveling and we meet up with people, and, and they gave they gave us a lot of like. A lot of advice and a lot of wisdom that I think that I that I would take to the mat, you know. And so I kind of think that even though my technique or my physical technique wasn't there, like I had this kind of like wisdom of my jiu-jitsu that, that I don't want to say it was like at a higher level. I don't want to really like want to brag, but I had this this kind of deep understanding just just based on on Ostro osmosis, like hanging out with like so many like high-level people and kind of applying all that kind of knowledge on the mat, you know. So I think when I was approaching my brown belt, like I kind of felt ready, you know, and. Um, I don't know, when I got it, like, it felt really good, and it was actually really cool, because I felt that immediately, as soon as I got my brown belt, my jiu-jitsu felt like it was way better. Does that make sense? I think because, like, I felt like I had to, like, start defending my belt, I had to start, like, showing my belt, and people started coming at me harder, and I, and I just fought harder. I didn't have, I didn't train as lazy as I did when it was a purple belt. Yeah, 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 I feel the same way. I, but to contrast what you're saying, I never felt like I deserved any of the belts I was given, but once I was awarded them, I felt like I needed to defend it, so it motivated me to train even harder. Yeah, and I think with me, I think because my my training with jiu-jitsu has kind of been inconsistent. You know, I was a purple belt for over three years, um, and and I, there's nobody to blame for that for me, except me, but um, I think even in that time when I like wasn't training, I mean, I'm still kind of part of jiu-jitsu, right? And I would train with guys who were like higher level with me, and I would do really, really well against them. And so I thought, like, Hey, these guys just got their brown belt, and I do pretty good, you know. I won't say any more than that. I do pretty good against them. It's like, you know, maybe I am ready for my brown belt. And if they give it to me, you know what, I'm going to respect the decision to give it to me, whether actually they do or not, you know, because if they think I'm a brown belt, then, hey, I'm a brown belt. Yeah. Do I think I'm a black belt? No, no, I'm not, not, I'm not, I'm not ready for it. Yeah. But I don't think anybody ever thinks that, right? I don't think everybody... I don't know. I think some people do, you know. That, that, uh, maybe they're... Uh, a big guy in a small pond and they're kicking everybody's ass and they think that they're maybe they are the best in that small group yeah and I think if you are a, a competitor and you're competing all the time and you're winning all the time then it's pretty clear you deserve that next right. right so when you think back on all of the lessons you've learned in jiu-jitsu what um, what stands out uh, um man there's so many um there are a lot. I don't even know. Like, I, I think because there are so many, I can't think of one. I mean, let me just. Let me just um, I think a lot of it. I think it, there are certain things that I gravitate to in terms of, in terms of, of what people teach me. Um, I'm kind of a more of a conceptual learner, and I think even when I teach, I teach kind of more conceptually. Um, gosh, I don't know, man. It, it, it's weird. There's always these really like small nuggets that we get from these people, right? I mean, you want to you want to ask me the question in a more specific. <laughs> Oh, we have jiu-jitsu. We can save that for part two. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, I'm curious, when we go on, on these shoots to all these cool places with these amazing instructors, I'm always the one that gets to train with them the whole time and ask the questions and stuff. You're behind the cameras and making it all look pretty at the end. Do you ever, uh, do you ever get jealous and wish you were the one in there? No, no. Not, not to get beat up, you know, rolled up. Um... Yes and no. I mean, I think because it, it would be cool to look back and say, wow, you know, I, I, I got to roll with Bar Braulio Stima, I got to train with these guys. But on the other side, like, I'm really feel, I really feel blessed to have been the one capturing those moments, you know. Uh, I've met with a really lot, a lot of cool people. And, you know, I, my passion for jiu-jitsu, or my passion for photography or videography, runs just as deep as jiu-jitsu. So, um, no, I, I, I feel just as good just being behind the camera and being able to, to witness and experience and capture those moments and preserve them for, for posterity. Which shoot have you, do you have the best memories of? Um, you know, we've done a lot of really high level guys. Um, and those shoots are, are fun too, but I, I would say something like the Guam episode was probably 
my favorite because I got to do everything. I remember I, I remember I, I arrived in Guam and I think I had 12 cameras with me in total if you, if you counted my iPhone. Um, and then we spent a week there and just met really amazing people. And it was just really amazing to speak in a common language in a foreign land, right? Um, and just to see the kind of passion that these people in this very small island had, not not just for family and jujitsu and all that stuff, but just kind of everything in their life. They were so passionate about it. We made some really amazing friends, right? People that I'm still friends with today. And, um, yeah, that was probably my favorite experience being behind the camera. And that episode still gets a lot of great feedback, yeah. despite the fact that there's no really high-level guys in it. No. So if you haven't checked out the Guam episode of Rolled Up, uh, please do. That was, uh, yeah, I feel the same way. That was a great one to be to be part of. Just seeing how popular Jiu-Jitsu was in such a small place. Yeah. How yeah. passionate people were. So um, looking forward to 2016. What are your thoughts on uh, on your own training and uh, anything else that might come to mind? Um, hmm. In terms of Jiu-Jitsu, you know, I... I took a little bit of time off jiu-jitsu just to kind of let some injuries heal up. Um, but I feel like I'm ready. I feel like my back is, is, is back and you know, I'm ready to train. And, um, I think the time off has actually been really, really good. And I think this is, could be actually a, a, a vlog topic on its own. It's, it's, uh, it's taking a break from your, from your interests to let your body heal and to be able to come back fresh. And I've been able to do that in other sports that I've been involved in. And like, you kind of have this feeling of, of guilt that you're not training you're not doing something um but it's actually really good for you for for your body and i think it's really good for your brain and, um you can't think about too much of like what you're missing but think about how when you come back how you're just going to come back stronger um and that's what i feel when i get back to jiu-jitsu like um, my approach to jiu-jitsu is going to be really really different i'm going to train different so i'm not going to be subjecting myself to the injuries that i experienced this last year um let me train a little bit lighter maybe a little bit smarter you know with less with less ego, if that's possible. <laughs> um, yeah, but that, that, that's that's where I'm at with my I mean, yeah, yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited to actually learn. I'm actually, actually excited to kind of like go back and learn more of the basics, you know, and, and really get that stuff kind of like really dialed in. What do you mean by basics? Well, you know, I think there's a, it's funny, there's this huge irony in jiu-jitsu, I think, that some of the first things you learn in jiu-jitsu turn out to be the most difficult things to do in jiu-jitsu. You know, an example is like doing an armbar from the guard. It's probably, you know, it's like week one jiu-jitsu, right? Um, but I find that to be one of the most difficult things to do in jiu-jitsu because as you progress in jiu-jitsu, guys get stronger, your training partners get stronger. They understand that they don't want to have broken posture within the guard. And and even like with a blue belt or purple belt, like he understands, like I can't have my chest on hands because I'm going to get caught and so I'm going to get choked, I'm going to get armbar. And so, like, kind of like dealing with like the, the strength and like people's understanding of jujitsu, like those techniques to me have gotten really difficult. Like, I don't remember the last time I've armbarred somebody from the closed guard, you know. And, and I want to do that. And, and but at the same time, I've trained with really high level guys, and I can't keep posture in the guard. They're just constantly breaking me down and they're catching me from the guard, you know. Like, I want to know what those nuances are to control somebody, and, you know. And certainly, I can do it with like a white belt and blue belt with higher level guys. It becomes really challenging. Um, there's that stuff, um, there's just kind of basic stuff like I think that looks basic but it's a lot of pressure from like really from passing. You know, I think something like a hip bump swing but there's a lot of little details wrapped up in that. Um, I really like the idea of just kind of using pressure from the top, you know, side control, you know, even from, from half guard. Smaller movements, you know, those type of things. They don't, certainly don't look fancy, they look really basic but there's a lot of little details in there to really kind of help control people. and. and advance your position and those type of things. That's the way I see it. The last instructional that we filmed just a few weeks ago was with Philippe Delamonica, who is also the head instructor of Gracie Baja headquarters in Irvine. And uh, his best position, one of his strongest positions is the reverse half guard. So mm -hmm. this two DB sets all on reverse half guard. Um, I think you fell victim to his, uh, his sweeps yeah. from there before. Are you looking forward to working on, uh, on that position? Um, yes, uh, I, I know a couple sweeps from that position, um, 
and I think the challenging part with that is is, is having a, a attorney partner that you know is going to end up falling into reverse uh, half guard. Um, and that's you know in some schools, people, some people don't ever get to that position, so it's, it's kind of sometimes hard to train a position like that, you know. But at the same time, Philippe does really interesting things to kind of force you or kind of bait you into falling into reverse half guard to where you think you have an opportunity to pass, right? And then he sweeps from there, and that and that's that's what I want to that's what I want to learn. It's because most of the time at our school, like nobody falls into into reverse half guard. They're they're because you feel super vulnerable, right, when you're in reverse half guard. Like you're either gonna get swept or I don't think a lot of people know how to pass from reverse half guard. But he does interesting things where he kind of dives under like uh, deep half guard and then kind of baits you into reverse half guard and he makes you feel really uncomfortable and next thing you know he's like tossing you over and he's so good at it. He's incredibly good at it. And like you and, and you know like you train with him like all right I'm not gonna fall in reverse de la Hiva. and the next thing you know like you're I mean sorry reverse half guard. Next thing you know like you're in reverse half guard. Yeah. So awesome. Just like a chess match, he'll put you in a position where you have to make a choice. You're either gonna get your back taken, or you're gonna go to reverse half guard. Yeah. So you have to go to reverse half guard. Yeah. And he gets swept. But he, you know, he's uh, he's probably one of the funnest guys to train with, right? Yeah. Okay. And I think this is this is a whole different topic. But I've always thought that like you should be able to train jujitsu effectively and have a smile on your face. And I find that like when I train with with, with Philippe, like. It's just, we're just laughing the entire time. Like, with every step, we just, like, giggle because we're like, it's like, I'm not going to let you do that. And then he throws me in this weird position, and then we're just, like, laughing because he put me there. Yeah. But, yeah, that, that's, I was actually really surprised. Like, he has that position. He knows it so well. Like, he, he, I was surprised at how many details he had. I mean, we, we did what? Uh, over 30 techniques. Over 30 techniques, yeah. And I, and at the time, I, but I still actually only really know one sweep from there. And I was really surprised. Like, 30 techniques in total. It's pretty impressive. Really cool stuff. All right. Well, thanks for sharing a little bit about yourself today, Dave. Yeah. Thanks for thanks for letting me chat. So, uh, UBI, let's go. Yep. Let's go. Talk to you guys later.